Many people have disdain for people who are Jewish. They, for some reason, even the church, and yet the Jews are a key to the kingdom of God for the Christian. Stay tuned and see exactly what I'm talking about. Good evening. My name is Pastor Bob Cutting, and this program is called Christians Alive. It's about Christians that get out of the pew and put their faith in action. And we've captured one on the street right here, and he comes from a long distance. Uh, when he starts talking, I think you'll be charmed by his accent, and you'll know exactly where he is from. Your name is? Grant Berry. Um, I am originally English, but I've been in New York for over 30 years but you haven't lost uh, the uh, charming accent, as some people say. Well, some, um, when I go home, um, they're not sure these days. I, I, think, uh, I think my accent's somewhere out in the Atlantic. <laughs> <laughs> now, why, um, uh, what, what is special about how you've put your faith in action? Tell us a little bit about your story. Well, Bob, um, I'm a, uh, a Jewish believer in the Messiah. I met him uh, about 27 years ago. And um, um, he really changed my life. Um, as a Jew, um, our journey uh, to faith in Yeshua is um, somewhat different to uh, others uh, around the world in the sense that we have um, 2,000 years of misunderstanding um, and persecutions against our people, so that so much so the name of Christ is, you know, a definite no-no. Um, and um, inherently, as Jews, we've been indoctrinated to, to believe that Jesus was not the Jewish Messiah, even though Christianity was started uh, by Jews. Uh, in fact, all of the covenants uh, that were uh, given from God um, Five out of the eight of them were actually given to Israel. And interestingly enough, when a Gentile person believes in, in, uh, uh, in Yeshua, they actually become part of Israel. So the whole thing is a little bit messed up. And um, um, as I quickly learned myself, Bob, uh, it didn't take me long to realize who was behind it. Um, and I quickly had to learn that God was not the one to blame for the many persecutions and the problems uh, uh, against our people. Um, and um, um, realized that beyond man's own weaknesses, that of course, you know, there is a devil um, that uh, has come against my people um, almost since time began. Now, many Christians believe that they're due or coming up to persecution. What kind of advice from the uh, experience that you have of, uh, uh, of the Jewish people uh, can you give them? Um, that's an, an interesting question. Um, um, there are different, there are different uh, philosophies, there's different theology about this subject. Um, um, I believe, I can only tell you what I personally believe, Bob, is that, that we've already begun um, a, uh, we've entered into a prophetic time. And interesting enough, you know, I believe God is very interested. Now, what is this, uh, before you go on, I'm sorry, uh, yeah. for people that may not understand, what does prophetic time mean? Prophetic is, is, is a time that has been foretold by the prophets of old, by the scriptures, by the word of God. Um, we are definitely coming into a prophetic time. I believe that uh, 
that we are truly living in the end days. Now, in should we just take your word on this, or are there some kind of things that, we, that, that somebody at home can say, well, you know, he makes sense? You know, Bob, interesting enough, I think God is very interested in signs, dates, timing is, I think, very important to God and sometimes very difficult for us to understand exactly how God moves. But this doesn't necessarily mean that we shouldn't take interest. For example, in Israel, on the holiday of Hanukkah, which is the holiday that celebrates the great light of the world, a gift of lights, on the first day of Hanukkah in December, on December 11th, there was a massive fire. Now, the fire actually started amongst two kids, I believe, by accident. But I don't believe the way the fire spread was such an accident. The fire occurred on Mount Carmel. Mount Carmel is where God used the prophet Elijah to expose the gods of Baal, which really today are the gods of the world. And I believe that in those fires, this was the greatest fire of Israel's history, sadly, a number of over 40 people's lives were lost, um, and we mourn those lives. Um, having, having said that, I believe that the fire was a prophetic sign that, um, that God was going to begin to show himself, because this is what happened uh, with the story with Elijah when, when God sent the fire and he literally wiped out the gods of Baal. Just look what happened. In, uh, in the first six months of this year. The, I don't know whether you, you noticed uh, on the news, the birds, dead birds falling out the air, millions of fish all over the world, not just in America, not just in different states, all over the world. Tsunamis, volcanoes, earthquakes, um, tornadoes, more powerful. Something's happening. E economies collapsing. I mean, almost every week, on the news, we're seeing something. And I believe that we are beginning to enter into a time of shaking where the God of Israel is going to begin to show himself more to humanity as he has done in strategic times in history. So when you talk about entering a time of suffering, it is possible that, um, that uh, uh, we can experience shaking and calamity. Um, but one thing I've learned about my God and my relationship with him is that as I put my trust in him, he will protect me and watch over me. So this time of shaking or shaking out is a time for people to get their faith right with God. I think any time is a good time for people to get their faith with God. But I, you know, it's interesting. People out in the world, secular people, are beginning to answer questions. Even a lot of Jewish people that I am around, secular Jews, what's going on here? There is definitely something happening. And you know what? This is a good time for the gospel because we can give answers to people that they just don't have. I mean, God, um, God um, gave us his son, gave us new life. I, call, I focus it very much on the new covenant because I'm so focused to ministry to my people, the Jewish people, that I, I try and explain to my people that this is the covenant that was given to them that we have yet to come into, even though uh, a, a smaller percentage of us believed at the time of, of Christ's coming, and we actually, God actually used us to establish the church. It wasn't long before the church started to turn away from its Hebraic roots. And that's kind of a little bit about what my ministry is about, Bob. Well, tell us more. You've, you've whetted our appetites. What is your ministry about? Um, well, first of all, we have a ministry in, West, in uh, Westchester, New York, um, and called Messiah's House. And uh, Messiah's House reaches out as a parachurch ministry to reach out to work alongside the church so that we can help the church reconnect its focus and its heart towards Israel. I really believe uh, this also includes the uh, southern New England area. And uh, we have meetings once a month that are focused 
on bringing the gospel to our Jewish friends and creating an outreach for, uh, for the church to bring Jewish people to where they can receive it in more of a way that the good news is connected back to the roots of the faith. Now, when you think about it, it shouldn't be like that. You sh it shouldn't be that a Jewish person should go into a church and it should be so foreign, Bob. But the church, in, 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 in fairness, the church has almost become a separate entity. And I don't believe that this is really God's will. And especially in the end days, I believe that God is looking to refocus the unity of his family. Um, he, uh, God loves all people. Uh, he, he came first to the Jew and then to the Gentile. And this is how he, indeed he looks at his family. But his desire, even Yeshua, when you read in, in John 17, he's taking on the sin of the world in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's sweating blood. And yet there in the garden, if you read the chapter carefully, John 17, the first 20 verses, he prays for his Jewish apostles. And then in 21, he switches and says, now I'm going to pray for those that will believe in your message, which are the Gentiles, that were to receive the gospel through the apostles' work that, was laid, let, that laid the foundation for the church. And of course, at the end of the chapter, you see the very heart of Yeshua, which is that we would be one that Jew and Gentile would be one, that we would be a family. Sadly, up to this point, not most of us, but the majority of the church has failed God in this area. And many tragic things happen to our people that, to deepen the chasm between the two groups. But the wonderful thing about God is his mercy. And even when you look at the scriptures, all the prophecies about how God scolds Israel in the end days. At the end of the chapter or, or the verse, the, the prophet turns and says, now God's heart will have compassion and mercy and draw them back. And you know what? It's sa the same for the church. Humanity, Israel, suffered the law. Really, not just for themselves, but for the world. They went through the law. Who Could you have gone through the law? Could you, without the power of the Holy Spirit, Bob, could you have been faithful to that law? No. We know it's impossible. We know only one was able to. His name was Yeshua HaMashiach. He paid the price. He was our Yom Kippur. He shed his blood and broke the curtain between the holy place and the holy of holies and brought us into the new covenant, which is what I so greatly am looking forward for my people to receive. But there's so much stuff and junk that needs to get worked through and healed. So much love and forgiveness. And the point I was making was if you read towards the end of Romans 11, God, Paul, well, God talks about mercy, his mercy through Paul. And he talks about how, how, we, how uh, we, how the church because it received the mercy of God, should release the mercy back to those that have been blinded for a season. Remember, it says in Romans that Israel has only received a hardening for a period of time. And this has been the, the, the really, what's the word, the paradox, I guess I'm looking for the, for the church, a dichotomy, because because whenever the church tried to reach out to them, of course, they rejected it, okay? Because they were meant to, because they were signed. My people have been signed and sealed for these days. And that's why I'm sitting here today, Bob. I'm a Jew. I'm one of those remnant. But I'm one of those remnant that has been called to help awaken my people. But I believe that my people need to be awakened through you. I believe that God wants to pour his mercy through you in the church to stand in the gap for the family of God. Let me tell you a brief story. Do I have time? Sure. Prodigal Son is a wonderful story, a great reflection of how the Father looks towards the Jew and the Gentile. And 
for a moment, let's twist the positions. Let's uh, t t switch, uh, uh, switch the positions, better word. Switch the positions. The younger son goes off. Remember, when the new covenant came and, and the Jews took it to the world, who received it? Who took the baton? The Gentiles received it. So, in a sense, with the new covenant, they really are the older brother, even though even though Israel technically is the older brother because it's firstborn. A little bit of confusing, but I'm trying to explain this particular, uh, this particular scripture. And in this story, of course, we know the younger brother goes off. He gets half the inheritance from his father, and he goes off and he blows everything. And uh, he lives a, uh, a wild life, and uh, bad times come on on the... On, on the on, uh, their economy during those days, kind of like they are now, and he ends up in a pig farm eating pig food. And of course his brother has been faithful. He has carried the baton of his father, and he has watched over his father's house, and he has managed his father's house. But the younger brother went off. He made terrible mistakes. And then of course you have the father and the father, you can almost imagine the father sitting on his rocking chair on his front porch, waiting, feeling you can only know what it's like as a parent when your child goes off and does something that they shouldn't do. And y you, uh, when they become adults, what can you do except for pray? And the father is there standing in the gap for his son, never letting go of him, praying, weeping, crying out, because he knows his son must come home. He must be restored so that all things can come into place and the order can be fulfilled. And so, all of a sudden, the younger son, now in a pig farm, barely eating uh, food from the, uh, that, a, that a pig would eat, comes to his senses, and he says, I'll become like one of my father's servants. I don't care. I'm going home. And of course, you can see this rocking chair on this porch, and it's, it's got this long path. You can see a quarter mile down the street. And the father's on the rocking chair, and he's praying for his son to come home. And he sees his son. And his son is walking and he runs. He runs. My son. My son. And he sees the heart and the change. He could see it in his spirit that his son has come to his senses. And his son has awakened. And he runs to him. And he and he puts his arms around him with joy, and his son embraces him, and you can see the embrace and the connection for this loss and separation. For today, my, for, for, for my son was lost, but today he is born, and he is born again. And of course, the father celebrates and and holds the greatest feast he has for his son who was dead has now come home. But the brother, the brother has been faithful. He's worked hard. He doesn't have the father's heart. He can't get it. He can't come into that place. And sometimes that picture of the brother can reflect where we are in the church. Because we have received the baton. We have looked after the church. We have watched over our father's house for all our mistakes. And one of the, the wonderful grace about the new covenant is that he, he covers our weaknesses and our mistakes. It's, he's paid for our sins. I mean, we learn, we learn through trial and error in the new covenant, and it's wonderful. But the, in these last days, the only way for us to reconnect the family 
is to come into the Father's heart. And in order for that to happen, we have to be prepared to examine the things in our heart. We have to allow the Holy Spirit in, whether it's ignorance, which even Paul warned us about. Do not be ignorant, Paul said in Romans 11. It could be jealousy. Heaven knows the amount of anti-Semitism that has existed. Even much of the church believes in replacement theology, that it has replaced Israel. God has, that is, that is never going to happen. Yeshua cannot come back, Bob, until my people say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And until they reconnect. And I believe that God wants to deal with the things in our hearts, to change our hearts, to cause us to be able to reconnect with our family. You know what, Bob? I actually believe that a great deal of the division that exists in the church today is actually a result of the church's disconnection from Israel. If you go back to the second century, Constantine and the establishment of the, of the church look to move away from its Hebraic roots, from Passover, from, from uh, Shabbat, from the feasts. Uh, many of the apostles in the scriptures, even in second, is it second Corinthians 5, 7, where, where Paul speaks about celebrating the Passover. Um, um, I believe that we lost tragically when we disconnected from the roots of our faith, which is why the church seems like it's almost like a separate religion from, from Judaism, and it shouldn't be that way, because we are, draw, we are called to make Israel jealous. Why? Because we stepped into their, their new covenant, and we now have a relationship and intimacy with the God of Abraham, because he took us into the Holy of Holies. The curtain was broken, split in two, Holy of Holies, intimacy, personal relationship with God, and they don't have that at the moment. Uh, my people either have, in orthodoxy, a legalistic experience, and there is obviously where the word of God is, there's always truth, but then most Jews are secular because they turned away from that, experience and they have their traditions but where is the intimacy for us as God's chosen people we need to ask ourselves the question how come I don't have God the way they did and that's what happened to me a a, a Christian a Gentile believer hung on to my garment and wouldn't let go because and she made me jealous because I knew she had a relationship with with my God and I believe as a result of that disconnection, the enemy has, has almost has a right in the spiritual strongholds up there, which we know so little about, to foster the division because of the division that came from the church and Israel. Well, let's review for a minute what is the church to do to correct this problem. The, again, the new covenant is all about the heart. We need to come into a renunciation of our church relationship to, to Constantine's movement to break away from the church. We need to look into our hearts because all of us in the Gentile world, well, I wouldn't say all of us, but the great majority of us have been affected by some form of anti-Semitism. And unrepented or unconfessed stuff travels through the blood. We need to look into our hearts we need to search our hearts. We need to confess anything that is unclean. We need to repent of our connection. And then we need to start to find ways to bless Israel, to pray for them. In every church, there is a remnant. It's interesting. The remnant, there's a remnant of Jews that are in the kingdom, but there's a remnant of believers that have a, a hunger for Israel. In almost every church, you find them. Get with those people. Connect with them. Pastors, bless them. Raise up those leaders. Let them start a Jewish ministry in your church. Have a Passover Seder. Um, celebrate Shavuot. Um, 
talk about how wonderful Yeshua is on Yom Kippur and the Holy of Holies and Hanukkah, the light of the world. Look through John 9 through 11, how Jesus himself showed himself to be the light of the world through this very holiday. There's so much connection and richness in these wonderful holidays that God has given us. And it's not Judaizing. It's not going back. We're in the new covenant. We have liberty. But, but it, these, the, the feasts are so full of richness. And we can use them to make our people, make the Jewish people jealous because we have relationship with their God. Why? Grant, do you have an uphill fight? <laughs> I, I have tried to get Christians together, and they have so uh, of a light faith, I have to tell you, in this way. In other words, some Methodists won't go to some Baptist church because they're afraid they'll change. Now hold it. If you have a relationship with God, don't have to be afraid of any other part of the faith. Oh, and now, what we should be doing, we should be strong enough in our relationship with God to know, hey, let's get some of our history. Let's get some of these things that have been passed down to us from our Jewish brothers. And, and not be afraid of practice. It's not going to change anything. Well, it's going to honor something that's historic, and it's historically ours. Well, it's not my fight. It's God's fight. I don't have the strength in myself to do this. But I have the strength through the power of the Holy Spirit. And he has called me and ordained me for this time in history. As he has called a number of others, Messianic believers, Jewish believers, he's raising up to go into the church and to, and to carry this torch to, to rekindle the connection between the two of us. And let me also say this. I want you to know, and I'm going to do this in front of the camera, I will carry this torch with you. Praise God. That's my commitment Praise to your God. ministry. Let me, let, me, let me also say this. There will be those in the church that will not receive this message. But we need to be really careful. Because when you look at Romans 11, Paul talks about an arrogance. He talks about a type of spirit that we have to be really careful about because God has not forsaken Israel. They're part of our family. And we have to learn to love them unconditionally, which we can only do through the heart of the Father, that his love would flow through us to them, to bring them into the kingdom. And just lay hold of one Jewish friend. Make a decision that you are going to pray for them every day. Uh, uh, reach out to them. Find a way through the Spirit of God in you to show them the love of God. And when God opens that door for you to speak to them, don't be afraid to open your mouth. He'll teach you, even if you say the wrong thing. He'll, we learn through trial and error. All God needs is a willing heart. Just that they would see your love and his love through you for them. That's what they need in this time. And that's what our message is all about in Messiah's house.